In 1184, in a city called Erfurt, around 60 to 80 noblemen and clergymen drowned in human excrements while attending a meeting with the King of Germany. Well, as always, there's more to the story than just that, but let me cut to the chase. Unlike other fun fact videos I have done on my channel, this one actually happened. But to understand how and why it happened, we have to delve into the complicated world of 12th century nobility politics of the Holy Roman Empire. Let's first look at Erfurt. Erfurt was a very important city in the Holy Roman Empire. It dates back to the 8th century and possibly, according to tradition, it has even earlier origins around the 5th century connected to the Germanic Thuringii tribe. The city gained large prominence when Charlemagne himself designated Erfurt in 805 as a border trading city with the Slavs in the east. Then as the Frankish power expanded more eastward and the Frankish Empire changed to the Holy Roman Empire, Erfurt no longer was a border trading city, but it still retained its exclusive trading rights. This trading was helped by the fact that Erfurt laid on one of the imperial roads, called the Via Regia. The imperial roads were toll roads within the Holy Roman Empire where your protection was guaranteed by the emperor himself. For a fee. This meant that Erfurt enjoyed a steady stream of traders traveling along this road in the early and high middle ages. The city also housed the royal palace on Petersburg Hill. Both the Carolingian and Ottonian dynasties used Erfurt as one of their seats of power. For example, it was here that Henry the Flower appointed Otto I as the sole successor to East Francia later to become the Holy Roman Empire. However, this very important city fell under the control of the Archbishopric of Mainz somewhere around the 10th and 11th century. We don't know exactly how or when this happened, but most likely it came about after the fall of the Ottonian dynasty and the rise of the Salian dynasty in the early 11th century. The Salians didn't continue with the tradition of having a royal seat in Erfurt, and therefore the city most likely fell into the control of the powerful Archbishopric of Mainz. The Salian dynasty later got replaced by the Hohenstaufen dynasty in the early 12th century, but more on them later. The fact that the Archbishopric of Mainz ended up controlling such an important city that was located in the middle of a duchy called Thuringia didn't sit well with the Thuringian ruling dynasty, the Ludovingians. Archbishopric of Mainz also controlled several other areas near and around Thuringia, which meant that the Ludovingians have always been contending with the Archbishopric of Mainz for control in central HRE. Of course, both of these entities were within the same state, the Holy Roman Empire, but the empire became more and more decentralized ever since the Ottonian dynasty and so fighting amongst the various duchies, principalities and bishoprics became increasingly common. Now that we understand the political setting, let's look at the three figures that made the Erfurt meeting possible, or a better word would be necessary. From my Guefs vs Ghibellines video, or from the far more popular oversimplified video on the War of the Bucket, you are probably aware of the centuries-long struggle between the Holy Roman Emperors and the Papacy. The main part of this very large and often vague and complicated struggle we need to understand at the moment is the fact that it wasn't clear whether the bishops within the Holy Roman Empire could be appointed by the Emperor or by the Pope. This was a big deal because some bishoprics and archbishoprics within the Holy Roman Empire, like Mainz for example, example, were very powerful, rich and controlled a lot of land. So whoever could appoint the guy who controlled this land would in essence have far more power. It also wasn't clear whether the Pope himself had to be appointed by the Emperor to officially be the Pope, or the Emperor had to be crowned by the Pope to officially be the Emperor. Of course, both parties supported opposite sides of this argument. With all this in mind, let's look at Mainz in 1159. The current Archbishop of Mainz, Arnold of Selenhofen, was extremely unpopular with some of the local population who promptly assassinated him. Due to this assassination, some of the canons fled from Mainz to Frankfurt where they elected a new Archbishop, a nobleman called Christian I. The people who stayed in Mainz in turn elected Rudolf of Zahringen. Promptly after these two elections, the two sides started fighting. The Holy Roman Emperor at the time, Friedrich Barbarossa, who was also the first First Hohenstaufen Emperor was kind of sick of all this infighting in Mainz and dismissed both archbishops while appointing his own archbishop Konrad of Wittelsbach. 
The Pope supporters in the comments are probably yelling, hey, he can't do that, only the Pope can appoint an Archbishop. But Barbarossa was one step ahead. He appointed an anti-Pope and had him dismiss both of the candidates and appoint Conrad as the Archbishop of Mainz. Of course, the actual story is a bit more complicated and there's more reasons to why Friedrich Barbarossa appointed an anti-Pope. He didn't just do it because of Mainz, but we don't have time to get into that. Obviously, the current Pope wasn't too happy with all of this. Also, the current ruler of Thuringia, Ludwig II, who was Friedrich's brother-in-law, wasn't too happy with this either, as he was a supporter of Christian I, who had a long-standing alliance slash friendship with Ludwig. Ludwig supported the election that happened in Frankfurt of Christian as the Archbishop of Mainz, hoping to finally get a favorable ruler in Mainz for Thuringia. This, however, did not happen, as Friedrich Barbarossa appointed Conrad for some reason, and so Ludwig started plotting against Conrad. While Mainz and Thuringia continued to clash with one another, the anti-pope who was appointed by Friedrich Barbarossa and who appointed Conrad as the Archbishop of Mainz died in 1164. Friedrich Barbarossa promptly appointed a new anti-pope who, however, wasn't liked by Conrad. Conrad during this time also started to become friends with the Pope in Rome and all this meant that he fell out of favor with the Emperor. Ludwig of Thuringia quickly took this opportunity and seized Erfurt from Mainz in 1165 while being supported in this by the Emperor. Conrad, seeing that the Emperor and Ludwig were against him, fled to Rome. Barbarossa then appointed a new Archbishop of Mainz, the aforementioned friend of Ludwig, Christian I. All of this happened while the Pope recognized Conrad to be the rightful Archbishop of Mainz, even though Conrad was originally appointed to that position by an anti-Pope. Confused yet? Great, let's continue. Ludwig gave Erfurt back to Mainz since it was now controlled by a family friend. Friedrich Barbarossa eventually signed a peace treaty with the Pope in 1177, ending the whole appointing of anti-popes. This peace treaty dealt with a lot of stuff we don't have time to get into, but one of its parts required the Pope to recognize Christian I as the rightful Archbishop of Mainz. However, Conrad will get the position after Christian dies. This happened in 1183 when Conrad again became the Archbishop of Mainz. Ludwig II of Thuringia was dead by now, but his son, Ludwig III, upon the return of Conrad to Mainz, quickly started plotting against him, continuing the family tradition. This plotting and intrigue had many forms, but to give you an example, Ludwig started to exert control over Erfurt by controlling the city's food supply. You see, the citizens of Erfurt had to buy food from the Duchy of Thuringia, which surrounded it. So Ludwig made sure that his subjects would accept Thuringian coins, not coins from mines, meaning Erfurt citizens had to have a supply of Thuringian coins to buy food. This way Ludwig could exert control over the city's economy. This obviously did not sit well with Conrad. But continuing on with the main story, it is now 1184, Conrad is the Archbishop of Mainz and is plotting against Thuringia, Ludwig III of Thuringia is plotting against Mainz, and Friedrich Barbarossa is having a big party to celebrate his victory over another unruly and very powerful subject of the Holy Roman Empire, Henry the Lion. I know what you're thinking, but we don't have time to get into that story, just know that Friedrich won and made a party to celebrate. This party was called the Diet of Pentecost, and it was held in Mainz. The party was in some sources called the most splendorous occasion yet, and it represented a highlight of the knightly way of life in the High Middle Ages. There was an entire city of tents and wooden buildings constructed just for this occasion on the island of Marawe, just in front of Mainz. There were more than 20,000 noblemen and knights present at this party. Even an entire wooden church was constructed in which the main procession of the Diet will occur. There were riding events, there were banquets, there were duels, basically everything you picture happening in a medieval celebration happened. During this celebration, Emperor Friedrich Barbarossa concurred upon his two sons a knighthood. His eldest son, King Henry VI, was already the king of Germany, so getting this knighthood was more symbolic than anything else. Speaking of the title of the king of Germany, it was usually held by people before they became the Holy Roman Emperor. That's why Henry VI, the eldest son of Friedrich, already held 
held the title because he was expected to become the emperor after his dad's death. There was also a bunch of drama that happened around Ludwig III of Thuringia and Conrad, the Archbishop of Mainz during this Diet of Pentecost, but there's a lack of sources about it and we also don't have time to get into that. Just be aware these two people were consistently actively plotting against each other even during a celebration. After the Diet ended, Emperor Friedrich gave his son, the newly knighted King Henry VI, a task to finally address the constant feuding between Thuringia and Mainz. And so Henry called for a royal hearing and Edward in the very city that was at the heart of the feuding. Also, it would be prudent to mention that Ludwig III of Thuringia was Henry VI's cousin. This is a common theme in nobility history, everyone's always somehow related. Anyways, going back to the royal hearing in Erfurt. Royal hearings rarely consisted of just addressing the main problem that was being talked about, in this case the feud between Ludwig and Conrad. Noblemen from all around the area where the hearing was held would show up to address the king with whatever problems they had, and some people would just show up for the event itself to see all the other important people and to meet the king. It wouldn't be far-fetched to think that as much as a hundred high-ranking people and their entourage showed up in Erfurt that July when the royal hearing was held. Also, the hearing itself didn't have to be done in one day, it could have been as much as a month-long ordeal. And it was during one of these July hearings in Erfurt that the incident I mentioned at the start of the video happened. We know for sure that the incident happened because there are almost 20 separate mentions of it in medieval sources. All the mentions of the Erfurt incident are a bit different but they all present the same story. The story goes that on the 25th of July, a meeting occurred between King Henry VI, Conrad the Archbishop of Mainz, Ludwig III of Thuringia, along with Nobilem Thuringiae, Civitatem, Cum Aliquibus, Principibus et Aliis Baronibus. Basically, there were also other noblemen of Thuringia, city officials with some princes and other barons. This meeting either occurred in the office of the provost of the Erfurt Cathedral or at the Petersburg Monastery just next door. The sources differ on this. At some point during the meeting, the wooden floor of the office collapsed under the weight of all the people in attendance. This collapsing floor then hit the wooden floor under it, which also collapsed, and under that was a cesspool filled with human excrements. Almost all the people in attendance fell into this cesspool and almost all of them died. The sources say that there were four causes of death. First, the fall itself. Second, falling debris from the collapsing floors hitting people. Third, drowning in the cesspool. And Fourth, the most common one, suffocation. This is because decomposing fecal matter produces hydrogen sulfide, which in very high concentrations can kill a person in just one breath, and so almost everyone died. Our three main protagonists, due to which the event was even organized, managed to survive. Conrad, the Archbishop of Mainz, and Henry VI were sitting on a windowsill during the collapse and so didn't fall, while Ludwig's quote, mangled body was barely rescued from the and he later recovered from the injuries. Almost everyone else, however, including the entourage of the king, died. You might be asking why was there a cesspool full of fecal matter under a building, but this practice was actually quite common. There were three main ways of getting rid of excrements in the Middle Ages. First, having a bucket, which you occasionally emptied just out on the street or into a nearby river. Second, having your toilets placed over a nearby stream, river or a moat. And third, digging a hole in the ground and just filling it up. These holes or cesspits or cesspools were either emptied every once in a while or just sealed up and a new cesspit was dug out somewhere else. Having a cesspit under the house, most likely in the vicinity of the latrines, was not uncommon. Plus, collapses like these during imperial meetings were also not uncommon. For example, in 1225, Henry VII held a royal meeting in the Nuremberg Castle when suddenly the staircase leading up to the meeting hall collapsed, killing everyone on and under the staircase. Around 40 noblemen perished that day. Going back to the Erfurt latrine accident though, modern retellings of the story talk of 60 to 80 dead people, which is certainly possible, but I did not find any specific numbers mentioned in any of the medieval sources, so the exact numbers of deaths is unknown, but it is certain that almost 95% of the people involved in this incident did die. All of the people involved were, as already mentioned, noblemen, princes, barons, city officials, etc. People like Count Henrik von Schwarzburg or Count Friedrich von Abenberg or Count Friedrich von Kirchberg, etc. 
all were now dead. Henry VI, in a bit of a shock, quickly departed the city after this incident and the whole feud between Mainz and Thuringia was never settled and continued on for decades. We know this because in 1232, Conrad, the brother of Ludwig, besieged, burned and plundered the city of Fritzlar, which was owned by the Mainz bishopric. All these political machinations that happened in the 12th century, along with the unfortunate Erfurt Latrine incident, really did not change many things in the political landscape of central HRE. With that said, however, at least through this close look at one specific region in the High Middle Ages, one can only imagine all the weird intrigue, feuds and unfortunate accidents that may have happened all across medieval Europe. Hello everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video. Yeah, I know it took a while to make this video, I'm sorry, but I'm currently very busy. Uh, but hopefully that will change in summer and I will start making more videos then. Uh, thank you for watching and special thanks to my patrons. And as always, stick around for history.